Pedestrians crowd the rainy streets of White Rock, Colorado. A couple exits a grocery store just as Jonah charges into them, knocking them down, spilling apples and oranges into shimmering puddles. Streetlights illuminate Jonah as he shouts a quick apology and runs into the street. A horn blares, headlights flash, Jonah slides over the hood of a yellow sedan into the path of a cyclist, knocking her down. She clambers to her feet, shouting at him as bullets whip through the air. Glancing over his shoulder, Jonah hard charges through a souvenir shop, breaking mugs and plates, and vaults through the back exit and into an alley, slipping on wet pavement. He springs to his feet and sprints away. Clearing a fence, he leaps, tumbles down a concrete embankment and quickly scrambles to hide behind a collection of garbage bins. As he catches his breath, two assailants in black trench coats rush by him, holding gleaming pistols with silencers. Jonah squints into the darkness after them. Realizing someone wasn't too happy, he decoded their seemingly random sounds broadcast from unknown locations. Spies, he imagines, sending names and coordinates through encrypted signals and pulses for reasons he still hasn't puzzled out. But his superiors pulled him off fast when he had managed to decrypt names of corporations and prominent billionaires. They pulled him off a bit too fast. And so he thought he'd investigate on his own. Not the best idea he'd ever had. But something in him had to know, had to understand why he was ordered to stay away from these cryptic messages that contain the names of people who would sometimes disappear. To him, this seemed somehow related to human trafficking. But Dean, Dean didn't fit the pattern. He wasn't like the others who had disappeared. He was loud and outspoken and blaming the government for everything that had happened to his students. He needed to find the high school teacher before these henchmen did. Screams reverberate from his cell phone as Jonah sits in his small, grimy motel room. He watches the fake footage created by a few teens in the area. The screen fills with teens running from an abandoned station as fog rolls after them with deadly hooks like talons trying to snatch them. He has no idea what he's looking at. Looks like the paintings he had once seen in the Fresno Museum with his mother when he was just a kid. Art would broaden his horizons, she had said. Not this art. This art scared the shit out of him. He never wanted to go to another museum again after that. Dean Barker was their teacher. His name was encrypted in the signals because he knows something. His students definitely told him something. Jonah closes the video and opens Dean's digital profile, hoping for a clue, any clue, to find him. Satellite facial recognition pictures in Dean's digital profile shows Jonah that the teacher often visits a community of homeless men and women carving out a meager existence under a busy overpass. He disembarks his car, walks down, and weaves through the small campfires, searching the cold, solemn faces illuminated by flicking orange light. After some time, he sees a man covered in blankets staring at him intently. As Jonah approaches the man, he jolts to his feet and charges away. Jonah sprints after him to the edge of the highway, where he watches Dean sprint past oncoming cars and disappear into the woods on the other side. With a heavy sigh, he returns to his car, trying to catch his breath, wondering what the hell this high school teacher knows that's got him so spooked. In the early morning, Jonah sits in his car, surveying a nursing home, hoping Dean will try to reach out to his father. He unexpectedly sighs with the realization that he hasn't contacted his parents for at least three weeks, and they're probably worried sick about him. He's a fool, and he knows it. You don't do that to the ones who loved 
raised and protected you for the better part of your life. He feels like a spoiled, ungrateful, entitled brat for letting so much time pass without taking one moment, just one moment in his day, to connect with them. Jonas stares at the entrance of the nursing home, telling himself he'll find some time to call his parents in the evening. Dean's father has Alzheimer's and needs constant support. He doesn't even want to begin to imagine a life where his parents forget him or don't remember how proud they are that he's using everything they instilled within him to protect and serve their country and the free world. He never admitted to them that he sometimes felt inadequate for spending most of his time behind a desk, despite his superiors telling him he was the right hand of very critical operations. The only problem is he has no idea what the left hand is doing with his work, and often Jonah feels like he's only being presented with a half-truth. It's why he's here. It's why he's running his own investigation with his savings. His perfectly reasonable questions about the corporations he deciphered from the signals touched a nerve. A major nerve. It was a reaction even his chief officer hadn't seen before, and he was officially ordered off the assignment. And so, being a good right hand, he officially moved on to a new assignment. Unofficially, though, he had questions he needed answered. As the sun slips below the horizon, Jonah spots a man leaving the nursing home through the side exit. Jonah disembarks and follows the man to the back of the home where he loses him, again. He curses under his breath and feels like he has to brush up on his field work. He needs to spend a little more time running investigations than sitting behind a desk, crunching numbers, searching for patterns, and talking baseball. With a sigh, he strides back to his car, tries to open the door, then realizes it's locked. He activates the remote in his pocket, opens the door, hops in, and starts the car. For a moment, he leans against the steering wheel as he stares at the entrance of the nursing home, frustrated with himself. He prepares to shift gears into reverse when the passenger door suddenly thrusts open and he finds himself staring at the barrel of a gun. Frustration turns to embarrassment as a hooded man jumps into the passenger seat and closes the door. Jonah raises his hands. Dean stares at him for a long moment, then lowers the gun. Why are you following me? I said I'd come to you when it was safe. Jonah lowers his hands. He has no idea what Dean's talking about, but he clearly thinks he's someone he's not. He shrugs. You need to be more careful. If I spotted you this easily, they'll spot you too. These people after me are highly trained, ex-military. They're pros. You don't see them coming before they put a bullet in your head. Jonah saw them coming when he was searching Dean's apartment. How do you know I'm not one of them? Dean swallows hard. I'd be dead by now. You still want to talk to me? It's not too late to back away from the rabbit hole. I do. Drive. I'll tell you where to go. Dean refers to Jonah as Max, thinking he works with an independent organization investigating a series of missing persons. He directs him to a dirt road, which he follows to an old decrepit wooden bridge. Jonah breaks to a stop by the woods and turns to Dean, who stares blankly at the bridge in the moonlight. Dean sighs. My father and I used to fish in the river under that bridge. We had some good times. What do you know about me, Max? Jonah turns his gaze from him. You were a high school teacher. You quit last year after the junkyard tragedy. That was no tragedy. I knew those kids. They didn't bad trip and kill each other. They did a lot of stupid things, but they didn't do that. 
Jonah nods attentively. At first, I thought Spook set them up, but then I realized it was much bigger than that. Aren't you going to take notes? Jonah taps his temple with a finger. I'll remember. Right. Well, Johnny and the others picked up signals from the old abandoned station in the mountains. Weird frequencies and vibrations. And they went up to see what was going on. And when they reached the station, they filmed a bunch of maniacs in robes conducting some ancient ritual while impaling some drugged man who had no idea what was going on. Jonah raises his eyebrows skeptically. That was fake footage. A prank to go viral. Dean shakes his head solemnly. I wish it were. They'd still be alive if it were. Mockingbirds embedded in the media told ten lies to hide one truth. Then they discredited and eliminated the source. Dean was referring to an old initiative which had been shut down years before Jonah was born. Jonah sighed skeptically and would have normally dismissed this man as a conspiracy junkie, except for the fact that his name was important enough to encrypt in a series of signals. Before they were eliminated, they went up to the station again and got more footage before those bastards destroyed the bridge to get up there. I released some of that footage, and they responded. Ten lies to hide one truth. And somehow I must have left a digital trail. Dean shakes his head and stares blankly out of the windshield. The rabbit hole goes deep on this one. Real deep. Our institutions have been compromised by a few idiots trying to bring a very dark thing into our world. Jonah nods thoughtfully just as a bullet punches into the rear of the car. Without hesitation, Dean vaults out into the high grass and charges through the woods. Jonah jumps out after him. Jonah moves stealthily through the shadows with his gun at the ready. He counted two assailants pursuing them, and he figures they're the same two who confronted him at Dean's apartment. Seems like a lot of heat for a conspiracy junkie peddling fake footage of ancient cults and deadly rituals. Quickly, he ducks in the underbrush and listens to steady footfalls growing louder and louder. He waits patiently for his pursuers. One runs past him. He lunges and knocks him unconscious with the butt of his revolver. He then slinks in the shadows and waits for the other. An instant later, he sees him rushing toward him. Just as he passes, he thrusts out his arm and clotheslines him. Then he quickly follows through with a pounding fist in the head. Straightening up, he calls out for Dean, and activating the light on his phone, proceeds to search for him. Jonah pulls up to the junkyard, hoping Dean has the same instinct. He disembarks, climbs over a chain-link fence, and surveys the area. Doesn't make sense. Something doesn't add up. His instinct tells him there are other possibilities. He takes a moment to clear his mind. Then he visualizes the teens arguing about what they should do next and where they should hide the evidence they've collected on this ancient cult. Johnny grabs an envelope and disappears amongst the piled cars. Joan appears at the cars and wonders if there's something hidden in the yard. Something the police may have overlooked. He figures he's got some time to kill before Dean shows up, if someone didn't get to him already. Ten lies to hide one truth. It's certainly possible. And it certainly sounds like something the agency would have done in its formative years when mandates were hazy and departments were run by psychopaths like Stomper and Carter. All those secret departments and experiments that had destroyed so many lives had been officially shut down. But unofficially? He could not say for certain. Unofficially, the programs could have moved to other branches of the government, or they could have been rebranded within the manifold compartments of the agency. He couldn't know, not for certain. 
With a sigh, Jonah gives up his futile search for something that would corroborate the teacher's story. He jumps on the hood of a gutted truck, lying on his back, staring at the stars with a terrible feeling rising from the pit of his stomach. He's never going to see the teacher again. Nor will anyone else. The teacher's gone. He'd never know the truth unless he bought some equipment and climbed up to the station to see for himself. Part of him wants to go home and just forget this whole ordeal. Another part of him wants to know, needs to know, needs to understand why he was pulled off the assignment so abruptly. The left hand didn't realize what the right hand was doing and panicked. That panic had caused a strange feeling inside of him. That very same feeling was there again. As when buried rumors of the agency creating and funding rebels to destabilize regions and sell weapons to governments began to resurface. The mere thought makes him want to quit and join his father on the farm. But he's never quit a thing in his life and he can't help but see how perfectly positioned he is to weed the garden from within. Perhaps even kill a few snakes while he's at it. Seems to him quitting would only allow the weeds to grow and the snakes to reign. He couldn't allow that, and he certainly couldn't turn his back on his country, even if it meant living a double life. It's what he was doing anyway, the more he thought about it, the more he realized he was in for the climb of his life. Perhaps even the fight of his life. <laughs>